Vladimir Putin's mindset is that if Trump wins or if Biden wins, that is a win for Putin, that he sees a Trump who might be unwilling to confront him. He sees a Biden who is incapable of confronting him. And so either way, he says, you know, I, if it's Trump or Biden, I know I'm in the driver's seat. I can do whatever I want. So first of all, Kurt, if you don't mind, I mean, many people have given their reaction to what Donald Trump said um, over the weekend. But, but what, now you've had a bit of time to consider it. What do you think of what he said? Well, the first thing that struck me is that he was talking about the past, not talking about the present. Mm. So he was saying, I said this, I said this, they did these things. It was all about saying how he was a glorious hero. He had achieved these things. Now he should be regarded as the guy who's in, you know, the most impressive person. So uh, I, I don't take that as a immediate threat today. Mm. I view it as him gloating, him taking pride in the things that he did before. Now, there is the problem, however, that by taking credit for this now, he is also then implicitly saying he would do it again. And if so, I think that is a real problem. I think that we can't have these kind of threats among NATO allies. We have to have NATO allies basically willing to work together towards a common cause. And that's what we're lacking right now. Um, so a couple of points on this. What What is the kind of effect on... Um on the mindset, uh, if you can call it that, of, of, of Vladimir Putin, for example, if he hears Donald Trump saying, talking about NATO again, he may be talking in the past, but, you know, we have an idea of, of, of how, you know, he feels irked by the funding situation. Um, what effect does it have on, um, on Vladimir Putin? Some people say it, it emboldens him. Well, I have to say, I think Vladimir Putin's mindset is that if Trump wins or if Biden wins, that is a win for Putin, that he sees a Trump who might be unwilling to confront him. He sees a Biden who is incapable of confronting him. And so either way, he says, you know, I, if it's Trump or Biden, I know I'm in the driver's seat. I can do whatever I want. And I think that is a terrible thing for the free world and for the United States. What about the the point that, I mean, is there anything in what Donald Trump said that, you know, I mean, he, he summarised it himself as that you've got to pay your bills. Is he right? Of course he's right. Yes, of course that's right. Everybody has to pay at least 2% of GDP on defence. Everyone has to take all of the threats that we face seriously. But they don't. Well... Um, some do, some don't. Um, so and am I right in saying am I right in saying that eleven of thirty of the thirty members met the two percent target last year? That sounds about right. Eleven sounds about right. Many are moving toward that two percent target, but have not yet reached it. But I think the bigger picture here is that um, everyone knows that Europe faces real threats. Europe has to have its own capacity to face these threats. The U.S. is, by treaty and by national interest, committed to helping Europe defend against these threats. But ultimately, it rests on Europe. Europe must be willing to defend itself. If that's not the case, it's hard to ask American taxpayers or British taxpayers or others to say, let's defend Europe if Europe is not doing its own share. So does that... I'm not sure what the word what the word is here, but does that make the kind of backbone, the structure of, of of NATO a bit more a bit more difficult to defend if people are not doing what they said they what they're committed to do in the first place? In other words, pay their bills. Well, I, this is the situation that NATO has faced for decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I started my work in the government in the Reagan administration. And there, the standard was 3% of GDP toward defense. Of course, nobody met that. But that was the idea, is that everybody had to pay enough. And in reality, no one has. And so it creates these political disconnects 
where you have Europeans feeling like we can't do this. And on the other hand, you have Americans feel that if you can't do this, then why should we? And that is the fundamental juxtaposition that we face through Clinton, you know, through Bush, through Obama, through uh, Trump first term, through Biden, and now we'll see what happens again. Now, you were President Trump's special representative on Ukraine from 2017 to 2019. I think I'm right in saying. Um, what yes. What do you think his, if he were to become president, because you, you've explained that that you think that um, uh, Joe Biden, if he, if he uh, is president again, that he's incapable of confronting Vladimir Putin. But, but, but President Trump, if, if he becomes president again, what... Um, what do you think he will actually do? What what will his what will his kind of method, his approach to this be? Well, the most important thing for President Trump is to feel that others are doing their share. And uh, what really irritates him and what really causes him to go against, you know, to speak out against NATO allies and so forth, is that we are doing our share as the United States paying well more than 2% of GDP on defense. Mm -hmm. And yet we see our European allies paying less, yet they are the ones that are facing an immediate security risk. So how can we tell American taxpayers that they should continue to pay for Europe's defense when Europe will not defend itself? That is his main argument. And the answer to that argument is for Europe to step up and pay for its own 2% of GDP for defense spending. And if it did that, I think it would actually create a change in tone coming from a future Trump administration. So if if all NATO members paid their 2%, so not 11 out of 30, but all 30 paid their 2%, you think that Donald Trump would be happy to continue spending the level that he that America currently does, including getting this for example, hypothetically, this $60 billion package through Congress? Well, you're conflating many things right now. The $60 billion package is an immediate issue under the Biden administration. It is something that can or can't be done with a Democrat, Senate, Republican Congress. Of course, no, of course. I'm, I'm saying hypothetically, would he do all those things? If there was... Um, a package that was going through Congress. I mean, this is hypothetical and in the future. My point is, is that if the Europeans did everything that they had to do, do you think, knowing Donald Trump as you do, that he would put put all the all the packages and continue at a rate of spending? Well, first off, I think the current issue of providing funding for Ukraine is one that happens before he there is even a U.S. election. So. It'll either be in favor or against without Donald Trump becoming president. Now, in the future, if we look at that, I think that the way I would say it is he would want to know that everybody else is doing their share. I don't think he's against support for Ukraine. I don't think that he is you know, enamored with Russia in reality. I think it's a tactic to show that He's open to negotiating, but I don't think he's really there. And uh, I think if we see European allies stepping up, paying 2% of GDP on defense, and articulating what they are willing to do, I think that will have an impact on the way that Donald Trump thinks about these issues. Right now, I think his thinking is, we do everything and our European allies take advantage of us. If he can change that dynamic, if we can say, actually, our European allies are doing X, Y, and Z quite a lot, and it's very important, and we need you to do the next bits here and there, or to actually support what others are doing, that's a different dynamic. Interesting. Thank you very much for your time, Kurt Volker. Thank you. Well, thank you.